Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again. And for those of you who are here in Cebu City or Metro Cebu, I just like to inform you that we are back with our in-person gathering. And so if you decide to join us physically, uh, you can join us in our main church in Banawa in uh, Good Shepherd Road. And so we invite you. We have a Saturday service, which is done in Cebuano. And this is at 9 o'clock in the morning. We have an English service at 9 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And then also 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And so again, let me just invite you, for those of you who are in Metro Cebu, please join us. I think it is so much better to see each other face to face. But then for those of you outside of Cebu, uh, welcome once again. It's our Sunday virtual service. And uh, I'd just like to share to you from the book of Lamentations. Now, the book of Lamentations is a very sad book. In fact, uh, the one who wrote it, Jeremiah, happens to be a weeping prophet. And why was he weeping? Well, he wept because of the sufferings and oppression of his people under the Babylonians. They were invaded by the Babylonians. Uh, the temple was destroyed, and some of them were brought into exile. And from that time on, uh, they were under the domination of this uh, Middle Eastern empire. And they suffered a lot. There was famine. There was poverty. In fact, it happened that uh, because they had no more, nothing more to eat, the mothers, the compassionate women, so to speak, began to eat the flesh of their own children. The people resorted to cannibalism. And many of their women were raped during the time of war. And the old were not shown mercy. And so... In this backdrop, obviously, you would then ask the question, is there really a God? Does he really care? And the truth of the matter is, the Lord was never at fault with his people. The Lord was never at fault with the nation of Israel. It was the nation of Israel who had been unfaithful to the Lord. It was the nation of Israel that apostatized and began to worship idols and they exercised religious syncretism. They began to add other gods to Yahweh. And the result of that was the wrath of God came upon them. First was the Assyrian exile and following was the Babylonian exile. Jeremiah saw all his prophecies come to pass. He saw the sufferings of his people. But then the Lord reminded him of his compassion. The Lord reminded him of his covenant-keeping love. And this is shown in the book of Lamentations in chapter 3. It says in verse 22, The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Now, you might be just like the people of Israel. Maybe you have backslidden. Maybe you have uh, slowly drifted away from the Lord. Maybe you have shown so much unfaithfulness in your life and probably you are at the point wherein you are suffering the consequences of your sin i'm here to encourage you that the mercies of god are new every morning and that his loving kindnesses never cease that is our hope and that is the the thing that makes us stand back up after we have fallen and friends, there is always hope in Jesus Christ. And that is why we have this eternal gratitude towards our God. And I hope that somehow you have been encouraged by 
this passage because it is indeed very encouraging, most especially for those of us who have failed the Lord. Let us rejoice in the mercies of God. Let us bask in His presence and let us worship the Lord. Let me invite you to rise from your seats and let's worship the Lord at this time. I will give thanks to you, my God. I will exalt your holy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and extol your glorious name forever and ever. I will give thanks to you, my God. I will exalt your holy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and extol your glorious name forever and ever. Jesus, the Son of God, born to give us life anew. You came to earth for all to see, truly God, truly Son of God. I will give thanks to you, my God. I will exalt your hope. the 
have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for a majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu International Incorporated and our website, www.livingword.ph and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM Broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Sambuanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Greetings everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. Good news brothers and sisters, Enough is Enough is making a comeback in our church right now. And we are selling it again at 275 pesos here in our church. And you can get a copy right now and share it among your friends. International Bible Institute would like to make an announcement. IBI is still accepting enrollees for the following online courses. OT101, the Pentateuch. OT102. Early Israelite History PE 304 Personal Evangelism CH 305 Church History HOM 306 Sermon Preparation and Delivery For more inquiries, you may contact 0917-771-6297 or 0922-864-7222 or email us at ibi.livingwordcm at yahoo.com or visit us at Facebook, International Bible Institute, Cebu Extension. Great news! IBI has a new charter in Palawan. You may get in touch with the IBI Palawan Charter at this address, 256 Abad Santos Extension, Bancao Bancao, Puerto Princesa City, Palawan. Or you may call 0920-853-7116 or 0909-300-8863 for more information. We have great news! 
We are happy to announce that we now have our very own Living Word Online Bookstore. Your favorite Living Word discipleship materials are now available for download straight to your devices. For a very minimal fee of 100 pesos only, you can now avail of the electronic copies in PDF format. Our Ephesians Volume 1 and Volume 2 are ready for your download. The Journey Series, Knowing Christ, is now available online as well. And likewise, we have free study materials like More Than Enough Study Guide, Enough is Enough Study Guide. To avail and for more details, please visit books.livingword.ph Stay tuned as we make more of our discipleship materials available on our online bookstore. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-000006-0800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 001-000006-0800. And send the receipt to office at livingword.ph. Then click send money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click give. And then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless. The title of today's sermon is The King's Program. We will take our text from Matthew 10 verses 5 to 10. Let's read the scriptures. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for this blessed time you've given us, O God, that we might study your word. Our prayer is that you might give us understanding Illumine your scriptures, O God, that we might know your will and that we might abide according to your will. Lord, we seek your face at this time. May you honor your word, bring glory to your name, and Lord, anoint your servant that I might be able to speak 
your truth in clarity, in truth, and with passion. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, today we will be taking a look at the King's program. And as an introduction, I'd like to say that we just had our recent uh, elections. We concluded it already. And definitely one of the things that we are asking from our recently elected officials is, what is their program for our country? Now, obviously, that question carries with it a desire for us to somehow be met, uh, our needs to be met, rather. And that is what we want to happen. And in this particular case, as we examine the passage that we will be studying today, you and I will discover that the Lord Jesus Christ himself had a program. After all, Isaiah had declared that the government would rest upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Now, we are given here a detailed program of the Lord Jesus Christ intended to minister to the greatest need of mankind, which happens to be deliverance from sin, the power and the penalty of it. And what we discover here is Matthew, who is the press secretary of the Lord Jesus Christ, gives us what program the Lord had shared to them. And so let me just share to you the outline that we have for today. It's a three-point outline. And first of all, we will talk about the program and message of the king. And then we will talk about the power and authority of the king, which is found in verse 8a. And then finally, the financial policy and promise of the king as found in verses 8b as well as uh, verse 10. So let's dive into our study and let's talk about the program and the message of the king in verses 5 to 7. And so here's the program. In verse 5, it reads, These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, let's go into a little bit of a word study here because certain words carry some significance or relevance to our understanding of the text. Now, one of the words that I'd like us to study here would be the word instructing, which comes from the Greek word parangelo, which means uh, several things, actually. As a military term, it represented the order of an office to those under his command. And you and I know that a general's orders are normally obeyed without question. Another possible meaning is when it is used as a legal term, it was an official court summons, the equivalent of a modern subpoena, which to this regard made a person liable to severe punishment. And then likewise, this uh, word has been used as an ethical term. It represented a moral obligation that was binding on a person of integrity. In other words, if you made a vow or a promise to somebody, you are bound to keep the word or bound to keep that promise. And that is why people would say that you are a man of the word. Now, also, it was used as a medical term. It represented a doctor's prescription or instruction given to a patient. Now we know that uh, a qualified doctor's uh, prescription is very important for us to follow to the letter. Because obviously, if we want to get well and the doctor has the qualifications and experience, whatever he tells us would truly be beneficial to us. And that is if we want our health to be restored. And I'd like to share to you an article which I found in a medical journal. And somehow this uh, speaks about the problems that doctors have with their patients. And so allow me to read a portion of this article. It goes, some diseases are incurable, 
but not because there are no drugs or other forms of treatment to stop their course. Some diseases are incurable because the patient refuses to get cured. The classic example is the hypochondriac. In spite of the fact that he seems to be forever popping pills into his mouth or getting shots in his arms, he does not really want to get rid of his ulcers or his palpitation. These symptoms establish the fact that his health is not good, and poor health is an approved explanation for failure in business or in a profession or in family relations. But hypochondriacs are not the only bone of a, physician, of a physician's existence. There is a big group of individuals who come under the category of uncooperative patients. Painstakingly, the physician outlines a detailed program of treatment, what medicines are to be taken and how much, a list of permitted foods, graduated exercises, the kind of baths that need to be taken. But all that labor is wasted for his patient merrily goes on eating what he pleases and taking his medicines when and if he remembers. At the other end of the scale is another extraordinary individual who improves on the doctor's advice. If the doctor tells him to take one capsule of medicine, he takes three. Because if one capsule is good for me, three capsules should be three times as good. And I shall get, well, three times faster. This is the reasoning of people who overdo it. Now, obviously, you and I know that there are health consequences when you do not follow the instructions of the doctor. Oftentimes, we just trust our gut feel, and we do not trust the doctor himself. Sometimes we think that the doctor is merely guessing what needs to be done in our case. But then again, we have to understand that doctors have studied for so many years. In fact, not only have they studied for eight years, but they've also studied in terms of uh, the, the specialty that they have gotten into. And then they have their continual conferences and seminars, and they continually study medical journals. And so definitely comparing ourselves with them, obviously, we need to trust them because they know so much better. Now, using um, that analogy, the word here, by the way, was also used to refer to certain accepted standards or time-tested techniques. Uh, somebody once said, why reinvent the wheel when the wheel is already there? And so, in other words, the point is, if there is something that has been proven already, we don't need to experiment. All we need to do is follow what has been done successfully. Now, applying all these meanings that we have studied into the text, what it simply tells us is the importance of abiding by the Lord's instructions if you and I do not desire to fail. Now, I'd like to qualify, however, that the instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples was only for a particular season, meaning to say that it was only applicable for their day and for their time. I'm talking about their instruction to go only to the lost sheep of Israel and not to the Samaritans. All the other principles, however, still hold true for today. But the point I'd really like to drive at is that we need to obey the Lord's instructions with unquestioning obedience. Why? Because the Lord knows what He is doing. The Lord knows what is good in terms of what He wants to accomplish. And therefore, we have to trust Him enough to obey whatever He tells us. And this is true, my dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to our own personal lives. When the, the Lord requires us to do certain things, 
we must be careful to obey them and apply them in our lives. Again, the Lord knows better. And we have to trust the wisdom of God. After all, the wisdom of God is infinite, eternal, and perfect. And therefore, God can never, ever make a mistake. That is why we need to trust Him. Now, the Lord uh, instructs them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans. Now, let's talk about the Samaritans first of all. The Samaritans were half-breeds. They were part Jewish and part Gentile whose origin began soon after 722 BC when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and brought in Mesopotamians into Israel to intermarry with the Israelites. Now, the Gentiles, of course, refers to those who are not uh, Jews, those who have uh, foreign blood, so to speak. And so the question we'd like to ask is, why did the Lord not permit the disciples to go and preach to the Gentiles as well as the Samaritans? Well, the answer to that is this. The Lord had a specific message and promise given to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14. This was a specific promise to the nation of Israel. This was not a promise that was given to the Gentiles, and this was not a promise that was given to other nations. This promise was given only to the nation of Israel. And the promise is that God would establish the kingdom of David or the kingdom of Israel through the line of David. It would be a literal, physical, earthly, as well as spiritual kingdom. And again, this was a promise given to David that he would have an everlasting kingdom. So if this promise related to the nation of Israel, obviously that uh, provides the rationale why the Lord was saying to them, that you must not go the way of the Samaritans and not the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of Israel because this was a promise intended for them or directed towards them. So understand that the Lord was not discriminating other nations or that the Lord was a racist. The Lord had the plan for other nations. But then again, we have to understand the program of the king, most especially at that particular time. Now, we will talk about God's program for today, but again, we're talking about the program of the Lord at that time during His earthly ministry. Now, the question, of course, that I believe some of you are asking is, did God have a plan for other nations? Now, yes, and if Israel had somehow accepted the message and the person of the Messiah, what would have happened is that the kingdom would have been established with them. And if the kingdom had been established with them and the Lord Jesus Christ would reign over them and over the whole world, then what would happen is that Israel would now be tasked to spread the message of redemption to the other nations. That is what would have happened. Israel would have been used by God to evangelize the whole world. However, you and I know what happened. Israel rejected their Messiah, and therefore the kingdom, the millennial kingdom or the Davidic kingdom had to be postponed. But it's very clear, once again, that the Lord had a program for the other nations. In other words, the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ was ultimately global in nature. And this is what we see in some of the Old Testament passages, like for example, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, it says, And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now take note of that. It says, All 
the families of the earth will be blessed. And then in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3, it says, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. In other words, the aim of Jesus' mission was ultimately global. But first of all, Israel and then the world. And why Israel first again? Because of that promise that was given to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. Again, the Lord had a program that involved uh, the whole world. In other words, his, his program was all-encompassing and would be global in, in, in nature. Now, uh, we find here that the Jews uh, had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. and But anyway, we go back first to verse 6, which says, But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So again, the gospel was presented to the Jews, first of all, the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples preached to them and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what happened there was that the Jews rejected the message and the person of the Messiah. And the result of that was that the kingdom for Israel had to be postponed. Now, it does not mean that the kingdom was canceled it was only postponed and the kingdom of god uh, the kingdom of god's program will continue on for israel in the tribulation period now here's a question we have for ourselves had the jews accepted christ would that mean a crossless gospel in other words if the jews had accepted christ would jesus still need to die for the sins of men? And the answer to that is most definitely Jesus still had to go to the cross. And so it does not change anything at all. It does not change the narrative of the gospel. Even if the Jews had accepted Christ, Christ would still have to die to pay for the sins of the world. Now, the cross was the central mission of Christ to bring redemption to mankind. Now, quite interestingly, the Jews were called the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it seems to be a contradiction of terms because the nation of Israel, the Jews themselves, felt and they believed that they were children of God. Now, how could they be lost when they are children of God? But then again, the Lord Jesus was speaking about the reality of their spiritual state. They thought they were children of God, but in truth, they were lost. They were not really children of the Lord. And I'd like to cite certain passages just to make this clear to all of us. In Luke chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Therefore, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The implication here is that those who were descendants of Abraham were not necessarily children of God. They were not necessarily spiritual children of Abraham. Now we go to another passage in John chapter 8 verses 40 to 44 it states, "But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father." They said to him, "We were not born of fornication, we have one father, God." Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, 
and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now what a shocking statement Jesus made to the people of Israel that their father was the devil, that they were children of Satan. And obviously, that was something that was a shocker to a lot of Jews at that time, thinking and believing that they were children of God. But then again, Jesus was talking about the true state of their spirituality. They were not really children of God. Now, in terms of application, we do likewise here in the Philippines consider ourselves as children of of God. We say that we are the only Christian nation in the Far East, and somehow this has become a badge of pride amongst us because we believe that we are truly and genuinely Christians. However, when we get to study the way we live our lives and what we believe in, most especially those superstitious beliefs, we begin to understand that we're not really Christian according to what the Bible says. We are not biblical Christians, and we are not genuine Christians at all. Let me cite, of the th cite some of the things that we believe that are actually contrary to what the Scriptures state. For example, when we are transferring to another house, some of us believe that when we transfer, we have to transfer during full moon. And that when we do that, we have to bring with us uh, a, a, a salt and, and grains of rice together with us. And again, we ask ourselves, where does that belief come from? Again, it is a superstitious belief because we do not want to have any misfortune taking place in our lives. And then we have this uh, superstitious belief that we're not supposed to sweep during the night. Because when we sweep, sweep during the night, uh, what will happen is that uh, we're sweeping away all the good fortune from our lives. And then there's this belief that you need to have garlic in your own home if you want to drive away this, this bad spirits. And of course, there are many other superstitious beliefs that we hold on to. And none of these things actually are found in Scripture. And so again, we claim to be Christian, and yet there are so many things that we believe in that are not biblical and that are not Christian at all. And I'd like to be able to say that carrying the name of Christ carries with it a tremendous responsibility. And when we don't live up to the name of the Lord, which we use for ourselves, then I believe that there are serious consequences that will take place. And one of the things that I have discovered is that uh, we happen to be number one in terms of uh, natural disasters. Now, I got hold of uh, a certain statistic, and um, it basically states this. The Philippines ranks number one in worldwide occurrences of natural disasters since 1900. According to the Center for Research on Epidemiology of Disasters based in Belgium, from 1900 to 1991, we have had 702 natural disasters. India is number two with a very far 369. The U.S. is 368. Now, I don't have the latest data right now, but I suspect that we are still probably number one or somewhere uh, uh, around the top uh, among those that uh, suffer natural disasters. And this is unfortunate, but I think that is not accidental. That is not random. I believe that the Lord is chastising us because again, carrying the name of the Lord has certain responsibilities in the same way that God's chosen nation, Israel, carries with them 
a great responsibility because they carry the name of Yahweh. Now let's talk about the message of the program. In verse 7, it says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now there are two aspects to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And the first aspect is what we call as the millennial kingdom or the earthly Davidic kingdom. Now, some of us don't understand that the Lord was actually preaching an earthly kingdom, but that is actually what we find in the Lord's prayer when the Lord Jesus Christ said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And notice what it says, on earth as it is in heaven. So again, we're, we're talking about an earthly kingdom. Jesus was seeing an earthly kingdom. He was going to establish an earthly kingdom. And again, this was according to the promise that God had made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14. Now, this happens to be a literal, earthly, physical Davidic kingdom. Now, this kingdom, unfortunately, had been postponed because the Jews had rejected Jesus Christ. And therefore, it was postponed and it will take place in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the second aspect of this kingdom is the sovereign rule of Christ by salvation. Again, the sovereign rule of Christ by salvation. Now, this is the present program of the Lord. And this is accomplished through the preaching of the gospel. As we preach the gospel of salvation, it is how people enter into this kingdom. And again, this is a, a gospel that you and I need to preach so that souls might enter into God's kingdom. Now the phrase, and as you go, preach indicates that they were to preach on the move from city to city and from region to region. They are to be field preachers that are constantly moving from place to place. Now, this somehow suggests the urgency of the message. No time was to be wasted. Now, the message was urgent. Why? Because the king and the kingdom was ready. The king and the kingdom was ready. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so, Jesus was ready, the kingdom was ready, but the question was, the question is rather, was Israel ready? Was the Jewish nation ready? And you and I know the answer. They were not ready to receive their Messiah and they were not ready to receive their kingdom. Now, how do we find this? Well. Uh, let's have a look at Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. It says, When Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you, and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So yes, dear brothers and sisters, the king and the kingdom was ready. But the problem was Israel was not ready. And according to the Lord Jesus Christ, they missed the day of their visitation and for thousands of years they continue to suffer until they recognize their messiah and this will happen in the tribulation period and they will only begin to accept uh, or rather they will only begin to receive the promises given to david in the second coming of jesus christ and in the future millennial kingdom now in terms of application the message of salvation is still urgent in our day and in our time. 
And what is at stake here is the eternal destiny of men and women. People are lost apart from Christ. People are lost apart from the saving grace that comes through the cross of Jesus. And that is why the message of salvation is still urgent up until today. And we have to preach this to people, that Jesus is offering the free gift of eternal life. And the reason why he is able to offer it as a free gift, as something that we do not pay for and work for, is because he paid for it in Calvary. He died on the cross and paid the penalty of our sins. So he provided atoning grace. Our past, our present, and our future sins are forgiven in him. And all we need to do is to receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And if that happens, if we repent of our sins and we genuinely surrender our lives to Christ, then we are given the free gift of eternal life. And people are dying left and right, and we just have to preach the message to them. We have to be on the move, and we have to understand the urgency of bringing this message because anytime our friends may go, anytime our relatives might go, anytime our parents, our children might go. And that is why we have to be constantly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ for, a, for the redemption of mankind. Now let's talk about the power and authority of the king in verse 8a because the disciples were given that authority as we find it in verse 8. It says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Now they were, now they were given authority to perform that which is supernatural. Now, you and I know that professionals have confirming credentials. Like, for example, doctors and engineers need to graduate. They need to have their own diplomas, and they need to be able to pass the, the board. And when they do that, you know, we see their diplomas and we see their credentials. Now, obviously, that is needed if they are to have uh, people uh, who happen to be customers or patients. Now, the same thing is true when it came to the disciples. The supernatural power was intended to somehow fortify the credentials of the Messiah. And uh, what we find here is that to attest to Jesus' Messiahship, the power to perform miracles was given to the disciples. Healing was more than an act of kindness. It was proof of Jesus' messiahship. When we have a look at the Old Testament, we find that all these miracles, these supernatural occurrences, the healings and the restoration of the body were all part of the credentials of the Messiah. And um, that is why the coming kingdom of the Messiah will bring the removal of disease and the restoration of broken bodies. We see this in the following passages, for example. We see it in Isaiah 29, verse 18. It says, On that day the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. In Isaiah 35, verses 5 to 6, it says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. In Isaiah 42, verse 7, it says, To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. So clearly we find that the coming of the Messiah would bring in uh, supernatural signs like healing and the restoring of broken bodies. And that is why it was very important on the part of Jesus Christ to give the authority, this authority to perform miracles to his disciples because they were going out and spreading the message 
that the Messiah is here, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And how, how could they possibly prove that that statement is true? Again, it was by performing these miracle signs and wonders, and by doing that, they were in effect saying, these are the credentials that the Old Testament was speaking about, and Jesus Christ is now doing all of these things to prove to one and all that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, let's talk about the financial policy and the promise of the king in verses 8b all the way to verse 10. It says, Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff. What we find here is the financial policy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the financial policy of the Lord Jesus Christ was intended to show that his messengers were honest, that they had credibility, that they had integrity, that they were not mercenaries who were out there to uh, pick the pockets of people, but they were there because they were genuinely and sincerely seeking the benefit, the blessing, and the redemption of people. And this is the reason for the financial policy given by the king himself. Notice the instruction begins with, freely you receive, freely give. It was meant that they were not, the disciples were not to charge or ask anything when it came to their preaching or when it came to their healing. And why should that be true? Because in the first place, the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, most especially the preaching of salvation, came to the disciples for free. And then whatever benefits they received, whether it was um, healing or an act, a supernatural act, of, of God, again, it was freely given to them. And so freely they received and freely they must give as well. Salvation was free. The miraculous powers were free. And again, notice here, the context here had to do with the evangelization of the unbelievers. And it was very important, most especially in dealing with unbelievers, that they would be seen as true, honest prophets of God, rather than mercenaries, rather than false prophets who were greedy and materialistic. And that is why, again, we find here that there was wisdom in the program of the king. I recall one time uh, somebody telling me that you know, this, this born-again movement is nothing else but a religious business. Pastors are out there to make money for themselves. It is for this reason that in Living Word, we had decided to have a financial policy of living by faith, meaning to say many of our pastors do not receive any salary at all. And that is true as well in my case. In the 38 years that I have been serving here in Cebu, I have not received a salary. In fact, there were occasions when uh, the eldership had granted to me uh, certain allowances. Um, and eventually, I had to give up those allowances because I wanted to be able to live by faith so that my trust is in the Lord, that He would provide for all my needs. And God has been gracious and generous to me. He has indeed provided for me. Now, it would be mercenary on the part of the disciples to charge others for something that they received for free. This financial policy, as I mentioned to you, was good because it demonstrated their credibility as well as their integrity. And I think it's very important, most especially for ministers of God nowadays, to have that financial integrity and credibility so that pastors and ministers will not be accused that they are 
peddling the word of God, that they are peddlers of God's word, but that they are genuinely concerned for the souls of men. Now, when it comes to believers, however, ministry is something that should be supported by believers themselves. In other words, when it comes to the church, when it comes to those who claim to have received Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives, they have the duty and obligation to support the ministers of God. Why? Because being part of God's program and the program of God needs resources as well. They have to participate. They have to partner in the work of the Lord. And this is what we see in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Looking at Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, notice what it says here, who were contributing to their support out of their private means. In other words, here were a group of women who became believers, who were converted, who became born again. And because they were now genuine believers in Christ, they were now partnering in the work of the Lord, and they were supporting Jesus Christ together with his disciples financially. And I think that should be true for those who are already believers. But for those who are unbelievers, the principle is freely have we received, freely must we give. Now in verse 9, the Lord says, Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts. Now, the apostles not only were not to demand payment for their preaching and for their healing, but at the same time, they were not to raise funds in advance. All right? So that is what it means. They were not to accumulate a great amount of money before they launched themselves into mission work. There was no pre previous fundraising that was needed. Why? Because the Lord Jesus would provide for them. Jesus is saying that if he is employing them on a mission, then he is the one who would provide for them. And basically, that likewise is my motto. If the Lord has called me, then the Lord would provide for me. And the Lord, as I mentioned to you, has been very gracious and generous to me. Now, in verse 10, it says, uh, Do not acquire a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff. Now, again, we have to study um, basic ancient custom and, and culture at that time so that we could understand what the Lord was really trying to say here. Now, when the Lord speaks about a bag, it was talking about a food sack that was commonly carried on a trip since inns were usually expensive and scattered. So Jesus, in effect, was saying, you don't have to bring baon or you don't have to bring um, food uh, for you because I'm going to feed you. So again, uh, this is what it meant. Now it says here, coats or tunics. This corresponded to the Roman toga in those times. The second tunic was most probably used as a spare intended to provide warmth if it so happened that you were sleeping um, under, um, under the night or to spend the night rather in the open. Jesus was saying, you don't need to bring an extra coat. I'm going to provide shelter for you. And then the sandals, basically this is probably speaking about spare sandals, which could be used if one being used would wear out. Jesus was saying, don't bring extra sandals. The sandals you're wearing is not going to wear out. 
and then here the word staff now there seems to be a contradiction since mark chapter 6 verse 8 says that they could actually take a staff and perhaps there is really no contradiction because the phrase do not acquire may really mean don't get an extra staff just use the one you already have now the staff was useful for protection from robbers and wild animals Jesus was saying, don't bring an extra staff. I won't leave you out in the night where it's dangerous. I will provide shelter for your protection. So all of the things that the Lord Jesus was saying and prohibiting, by the way, were intended to tell them, I'm sending you out on a mission and I am the great shepherd. And as I send you out there, be sure, be certain, be assured that I will protect you that I will preserve you, that I will provide for you, that I will take care of you and take care of your needs. I will not leave you. I will not abandon you. I will not desert you. I will be there for you. So this is the whole point of uh, what Jesus was saying in terms of his instruction. And that is why we find the promise here. It says, for the worker is worthy of his support. The Lord Jesus Christ would not, quote-unquote, underpay them. He would provide for them. Now, the question, of course, that some of us might be asking, well, how does God provide? Well, first of all, He could provide through miraculous means. Let me share to you the story of John Brents, a friend of Martin Luther and one of the stalwarts of the Reformation. He incurred the hatred of Charles V, who made many attempts to kill him. Hearing that a troop of Spanish cavalry was on the way to arrest him, he cast himself upon God in prayer. At once, the guidance of the Holy Spirit came upon him. Take a loaf of bread and go into the upper town, and where you find a door open, enter and hide yourself under the roof. That was the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Now, he acted accordingly, found the only open door, and hid himself in the loft. For 14 days, one for 14 days, he lay there while the search continued. Now, try to imagine this. For 14 days, can one loaf of bread be sufficient? And obviously, we would say no. But here's what happened. Day by day, a hen came up to the garret and laid an egg without cackling. And that is how he was provided food. The 15th day, it did not come. But John Brent heard the people in the street say, they are gone at last. And so finally, he knew it was safe and he came out. But then again, his story tells us that in that 14-day period, while he was uh, isolated, while he was sort of quarantined, the Lord provided for him. So yes, the Lord can provide through miraculous means. At other times, he could provide through the support of believers. And that's exactly what happened in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples. And then it could also come from the hospitality uh, coming from those who sympathize with the gospel. So there you have it, brothers and sisters. We find here the, the very comprehensive program of the king himself. We find his uh, financial policy. We find the message that he wanted uh, to be preached. And he gave a promise to his disciples that he would take care of them. And now all of us obviously have a calling under God. We may not be called by the Lord to become full-time ministers or pastors or missionaries, regardless of whatever calling we might have. And God might be calling us to the workplace or God might be calling us to be a businessman. Whatever our calling is, understand this, the Lord is with you. And we have to make sure that we make what we do our own altar. And so if you're a businessman, be a businessman for the Lord. If you happen to be uh, working as an employee, be an employee for the Lord Jesus Christ. And never ever forget to preach the message of the gospel, 
because the message of the gospel is urgent and people need to hear the gospel as well. So yes, there are certain things that we find that uh, is now applicable in our day and our time, and we need to apply that as we go out and uh, fulfill our calling under God. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for today. Thank you for being with us in our study. And we pray that the lessons we learn, we might be able to apply in our lives and in our ministry. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Pleasant Sunday to one and all. And once again, please continue to like our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you get updated with our sermons. And so God bless you all, brothers and sisters. We'll see you next weekend. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM Broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Sambuanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Great news, everyone. We already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro, 
Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000068-00. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 001-0000060800, and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph. Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.